Hey everybody, this is Edwin the Magic Engineer again, and I wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, Mt. Gox, stuff like that. Um, this actually is a topic that seems to be like off the page of the other things I've spoken about, but it actually relates to you guys, Magic the Gathering players, uh, quite a bit. You might have heard about the infamous Mt. Gox closing. Well, um, that actually stood for Magic the Gathering Online Exchange. That's what Mount Gox actually was. Before it was ever a Bitcoin thing, Mount Gox was actually a place for people to like electronically meet up and figure out what trades they're going to do and do their online exchange. And eventually, uh, the Bitcoin worked its way in there because it used to be like a really cheap, easy way to actually exchange value. And then people just started exchanging between currency and Bitcoin, and it just kind of turned into a Bitcoin exchange. And uh, then, you know, Bitcoin got really big. It became the main exchange around the world. And then eventually, uh, Mt. Gox got hacked. And uh, that's when, you know, there was a big hit into uh, cryptos, and everybody got really worried about it. The thing to remember about Mt. Gox, though, is uh, let's say this uh, little computer I drew over here is the Mt. Gox server. What people effectively did is if you had your, your Bitcoin and you owned it and you electronically transferred over the internet all the way over to Mt. Gox and so they had your coin and then what you basically had at Mt. Gox was there was cash that was there and there was coins that were there and people would be going back and forth between coins and cash like on the Mt. Gox computer. The whole Security thing about Bitcoin exists because when you have a coin um, and it's encrypted inside this thing called the blockchain, when you when you have that copy of the blockchain and you have the ownership of the coin with this little key that you've got, so you have like a key written down, that's how you can prove to anyone that you've got it. And that key is never going to get cracked. It's super secure. But if you give your Bitcoin to someone else and you let them sit there and exchange it between money and Bitcoin, well, somebody doesn't have to crack that key in the Bitcoin, what's called the blockchain. All they have to do is hack this computer, get access to it, and then send those coins over the internet to someone else. And that's how Mt. Gox was effectively like stolen from. Nobody cracked the Bitcoin archive, but they actually got into those computers. But these computers, they were just, it was a Magic the Gathering online exchange. It wasn't an official currency exchange. It didn't have millions of dollars put into it to have all this infrastructure built up. So it was easy for someone to eventually crack it. And that's why it actually went down. But I wanted to have this video because there's a few things I wanted to talk about for, uh, for cryptocurrencies. Uh, things that you don't hear about very often. Everyone's really excited about it right now. Everyone's talking about cryptocurrencies and they want to do investment and stuff like that. But there's a few points that are, they're on the negative side. And you need to understand it because they do actually exist. So one of the points that is a big sticking point is there's this thing called the blockchain. And what happens is <clears throat> on the internet, someone has a copy of the blockchain, right? And that's this big archive of all the Bitcoins that exist and the transactions about them and stuff. And if you on your computer, you want to actually trade Bitcoin, you need to download a copy of the blockchain to your computer. And then you have, these are exact copies and they match. Then somebody somewhere else, they also download a copy of the blockchain. So everyone's got this copy of it, right? And this thing, it basically, um, it is, this is the essence of Bitcoin. When you have your coins and you send them to somebody else, like say this guy sends his coin over the internet to somebody else, well the blockchain has to have a little entry added. And all those blockchains have to stay in sync and they all have to synchronize with each other. Um, so if they get out of sync, then Bitcoin is basically failing, but that's kind of the strength of it because there's other computers elsewhere on the internet and they all have a copy of the blockchain, right? Um, everyone's got that same copy. Now, if these two guys tried to cheat the system, it's not going to work because these other ones on the internet say, no, 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 you didn't actually get that coin legitimately. You have to use the normal way. So it's the strength of the internet is the strength of Bitcoin. Now, but here's the problem. This blockchain, when I first started... Uh, actually mining coins on the graphics card of my computer. This blockchain um, started out like four gigabytes is how big it actually was. And then very quickly, the size of this blockchain actually grew. Um, like, so I can't remember exactly how long, like a year after I started like mining and doing, getting into other coins, 
I looked back again and the size of this blockchain had grown to like 40 gigabytes. One of the reasons is just that there was more coins that were mined, so there was more of them in existence. But besides that, um, it keeps a record of like all the transactions that actually happen. It's like a historical thing. So this thing just, just keeps growing, right? And of like all the people in the world, it's like, I think it's less than like 1% of the people in the world are actually using and transacting Bitcoins and the blockchain very quickly within a year got to like 40 gigabytes. Well, just this is, um, this is June of 2017. And just a little while ago, I updated the blockchain on my computer so I could send a Bitcoin over the internet. And I was surprised to see that the size of the blockchain had grown to 130 gigabytes. Well, that ends up being a really big problem because remember, everybody has to have the same size blockchain all over the internet for this whole thing to work. Well, if you're going to use the security of Bitcoin, which is questionable in this next example I'm about to give, you can't really store 130 gigabytes on things like your smartphone, right? Because, you know, most people's smartphones don't have 130 gigs of storage, or if they do, that's like almost all of it. So what most people will do that exchange Bitcoin is they will take their one coin and they'll give it to an exchange somewhere else. So say, here's an exchange. Somewhere else on the internet, right? And this guy gives his coin to the exchange and he gives his coin to the exchange. Well, these computers, they don't actually have the Bitcoin anymore. All that they have is they have a little piece of paper or they have a little file that says, you own a Bitcoin that exists on this exchange. So the security is no longer there because you don't have this, you don't have your blockchain and your coin locally. You gave it to these guys. And so your trust between yourself and that exchange is what the security effectively is. So the blockchain size, when it grew to this large size, it became so cumbersome, it destroyed the security aspect because most people don't actually do that. Now, um, there's another thing that's a problem with it. For something to actually be a currency, its value needs to be pretty stable. A currency needs to, um, it needs to maintain its value, right? I mean, if every dollar you spent tomorrow was going to be worth more and bought more stuff, you wouldn't spend your dollars. If every dollar you spent got less and less every day, you'd be spending them as fast as you could. It's only because dollars like maintain their value fairly well is why they can be used as a currency. Well, Bitcoin, I mean, you plot it on a graph and its value kind of like started, you know, like this was like a penny or something that eventually hit like, you know, $10. And it just started going through these big gaps where it would just gap up, right? And Bitcoin now, as, a, as I could do this video, it's something like $2,800 a coin, right? Insane amounts of money. But if you had used and transacted your Bitcoins way back here in time, maybe you spent thousand bitcoins and got a pizza right but like just one of those thousand bitcoins you if you saved it now it would be two thousand eight hundred dollars so you'd feel like a real idiot if you spend your bitcoins so what effectively happens is people don't spend their bitcoins they hold on to their bitcoins and they're waiting for the price to go up so since people are holding on to them they're not transacting them it's therefore not a currency anymore it's not acting like a currency and even if it did act like a currency. Let's like set all that example I just set aside. Let's say it was having a nice stable price, right? Bitcoin isn't free to use. When you try to send your Bitcoin from one computer to another, what effectively happens is um, you actually have to put a fee onto it. So let's say you send somebody one Bitcoin, one BTC, well, you don't just send that one BTC, you send it plus like some, some amount of, um, of change in Bitcoin and the transaction fees are pretty small, right? So plus that much BTC. So the actual amount that leaves your wallet is the one Bitcoin plus this really small Bitcoin fee. And if you don't put that on, then the, the internet will not process your Bitcoin. Because all these other computers that are running the whole cryptocurrency network, if they look at your little thing and say, oh, this guy wants to transfer a coin, but he's got no fee on there. I'm not going to process it for him. He's not paying me for it. It's my CPU cycles and my computer, so they don't do it. So if you don't include that fee, you have a coin that'll just sit there for like four days. And I did, by the way. I tried to send my Bitcoin somewhere and it sat there for like four days because I forgot that. And I even had to update the software before I could cancel it. But eventually... I updated the software, I canceled it, 
And then I put the transaction out and it still was like an hour or something for it to actually go through, even though I actually put a decent sized fee on it. So the blockchain size is an issue and it, it's not acting like a currency and it's not free to actually use on the internet. Um, another thing about Bitcoin is that it's not backed by anything. It's not like you can go somewhere and say, here's my Bitcoin, give me my amount of oil or give me my amount of like wood or give me Magic the Gathering cards or something. It's, there's nothing backing it and there's no government standing behind it, which basically means it could go super high or it could go to nothing, right? You're really risking something if you put a lot of money into it. So most people I know, they don't put a lot of money into it. They either got in early or maybe they buy one or two coins. But now there's people kind of piling in because it's like a fad and everyone's excited about it. But that doesn't mean it's gonna work. That just means that it's kind of like a fad, right? So another thing that's important to know about it is there is a big threat to Bitcoins. Uh, and the biggest threat, I think, isn't even necessarily like this government or this bank or something like that people worry about. Well, it's, it's other cryptocurrencies, right? There's another one called Litecoin. And I actually mined LTC. I mined Litecoins. I got like 30 of them from setting my graphics cards off on my computers and letting them just chunk away in mine. And so I got a bunch of them and I was all happy. And um, the price of the Litecoins kind of went up for a bit and then dropped. And so if I sold here, that would have been like really good. But if this became a really good thing, then the people that have Bitcoins might have actually left Bitcoin and gone to Litecoin. That's always a threat. That's always a possibility. Well, Litecoin ended up kind of diminishing. It's come back up a little bit now, but now there's this new one that everyone's talking about, and it's Ethereum. Ethereum is the latest Bitcoin, and honestly, the technology in it is much better than the previous ones. It is pretty good. I don't know a lot about its history and everything, but I know that it's really hot. When I first started looking at it, it was something like $70 a coin. Now, Ethereum is pretty much going for something like $260 a coin. In only like a few weeks, it shot up really fast, right? So that's very exciting. But let's say Ethereum does great and it takes off. Well, everyone's going to get rid of their Bitcoins and go get Ethereum. So it's like the biggest threat to Bitcoin is like other cryptocurrencies are actually a threat. So it's, kind of, it's, it's an interesting thing when it's all open source code and anyone can come up with their cryptocurrency. And if they can back it and make people excited about it, the mobs will rush over to that one. So currently that hasn't happened. Bitcoin has remained the number one, but its technology is the most outdated compared to all these others. And all it takes is one of these to have like a much better technology and then people behind it and it will eclipse Bitcoin. So um, those are just a few points that I think everyone should really consider. I'm not saying cryptocurrencies are terrible. I have friends that are into it. It has a lot of advantages. You gotta love how it's eliminating central banks and eliminating governments from the transactions and a lot of positive things about it. But there are negatives and you don't hear people talking about it very much. And so this is just one software engineer's perspective on what's good and what's bad about it. So anyways, thanks everyone for tuning in and uh, I'll see you in another episode of Edwin the Magic Engineer. Bye everybody.